All right, here we go. Sikkim 365 Radio. Sikkim 365.com is the umbrella of what we do. 365 Sports. The chat room has been just amazing again today, as have the text and calls. Now joined by Sam Bradshaw, S11. He will break down the X's and O's of what both teams do, what they do well, and how they can maybe try to uh, uh, change it. And Sam, there's no question, Oklahoma State, let's start with them. Their defense is really good. What is their weakness if they have one defensively? Thanks for having me on. And uh, as far as a weakness, obviously they're losing their top two pass rushers at that kind of jack linebacker spot that they like to line up in a number of different places. That's going to be a weakness for them. That takes a lot of guaranteed pressure off the table. And uh, additionally, you know, they've lost one of their best safeties. So having some new faces in there might be a little bit of a weakness. But so far, that defense has been playing lights out. I mean, they've locked down Tulsa. They locked down Missouri State. They locked down Boise. And they locked down Kansas State. Now, don't get me wrong. None of those offenses are Oklahoma this year particularly when K-State was playing the third-string quarterback and so on and so forth. But they're a very good defense that returns the vast majority of who they have from the prior year. Uh, it's a 4-2-5 scheme, but it might as well be a four-safety scheme because Malcolm Rodriguez, as Will Linebacker, was a, safe, was a safety starter for them back in 2018. And he still moves extremely well, and he gives them options and coverage. You know, Whereas Iowa State was content to sit back and zone and drop eight guys and let their big guys up front try and hold up against the run, Oklahoma State's smaller, they're quicker, they're going to take a lot more chances in coverage. You'll see more man, you'll see more quarters, you'll see a lot more gambling, a lot more movement, and it's going to be a challenge. Uh, I'm not saying one's better than the other, it's just it's a completely different matchup, and we haven't seen this offense and this quarterback have to deal with this type of team yet, so... I'll be interested to see how that unfolds. Sam, uh, how much did the offensive reinforcements that they have change how we need to look at Oklahoma State going forward compared to the first three games where they were out a lot of wide receivers and Spencer Sanders had no weapons and uh, he, he looked all around bad in the games he did play? Hell, he had COVID too. He was yeah, out COVID, for yeah. the very beginning, yeah. Well, their receiving room has certainly been a revolving door. Um, no question about that. But with Oklahoma State, you're still dealing, outside of Tate Martin, you're dealing with some guys that are pretty young. Um, I mean, Brennan Presley had a really nice bowl game against Miami, but he's still a pretty young guy. You know, you're dealing with a lot of guys that are kind of getting their first stripes at receiver. Um, their line is very similar to what they had last year, where there was a lot of inexperience, and they're still reeling a little bit from the loss of so many guys that they were expecting to have last fall that just for one reason or another had to leave the roster. And then you add to that the fact that they graduated Devin Jenkins, who was a very early second round pick at tackle. You know, so with them, their offense, I don't think is going to be the kind of caliber of offense that's going to let them mount a legitimate playoff run. But this seems a tough out because those skill guys, they can scoot and Sanders included. And he's got the upside. He reminds me a lot of former Kansas State quarterback Michael Bishop where he's a runner, but his arm strength can just throw it out of the yard. And it's going to be a challenge. Uh, I think Baylor should be able to hold up against the run with these guys pretty well with how they're handling things up front on the offensive line. Most of the running yards they've gotten this year have come off of wide zone cutbacks, and I think Baylor's going to be really disciplined against that uh, as they see it all the time. But, yeah, it's a wildly different a wildly different matchup than what they had last week where you had much more of an established line but a lot of the skill guys weren't necessarily going to run by you here i think it's a little bit of the opposite yeah what are your thoughts on uh one of those guys that could potentially do that uh sam and, and jalen warren who's been a big boost for them at running back he is a good he's a good running back built low to the ground very elusive can cut and run through tackles and they actually did a really good job getting him involved in the spring game the last last week against Kansas State. He had a couple long ones where the Wildcats were just completely outflanked. You know, finding a way to keep a handle on that on that screen game, taking away the cutback run. If you do that, you can put the game on Spencer Sanders, which I think plays into Baylor's benefit. Sanders is a good quarterback, but I think with the amount of uh, pressure 
that you could have Aranda and Roberts dial up. And some of the issues they've had in protection, i got to favor Baylor if they can get it into a game where it's dependent on that. But Baylor's defense has to play better. That was a very sloppy defensive game, and it didn't have to be nearly as close as it was. You can't extend drives with personal fouls. You can't completely bust coverages on running backs and tight ends. You have to play cleaner. So, Sam, I, I'm glad that you said that because I was curious. We, we've talked a little bit about Oklahoma State already, but what were your, your takeaways? And I, I read them. You know, everybody's had the chance to read your work on, on the website, but for those who don't, uh, what was your prevailing takeaways from that win over Iowa State, including what you just mentioned? Well, primary takeaway is that when this team plays clean, they're absolutely a Big 12 contender. The offense averaged over 50 yards of drive in the first half, was scoring – Seemingly it will. Um, they had a couple execution errors on the drives following that, following that fumble. And then they had one drive where they called it really conservatively just to make sure they got the field goal to go up eight. But the offense looked really good. Um, defensively, you did some things to disrupt them. You got more tackles for loss than Iowa State was used to kind of giving up. You were able to get in Purdy's face. You had three runs go really long on you, but for a good portion of the game, you were limited in their running back. But the problem is they had yet four penalties for 60 yards that directly led to six points. And then 10 of their passes went to the running back or tight end. Most of those were busted coverages for 193 yards. That's not going to get it done throughout the course of the season. You know, you had six passes of 20 plus yards all to the running backs or tight end. That's, that can't continue. And this is a pattern we've seen with this team throughout the year. Against Kansas, you had a fumble on a drive, and then they go and score when you have pass interference with send a drive. Mm-hmm. Texas State, you had a fumble set up a field goal that was longer than it needed to be, causing you to miss it. Then roughing punter extends a field goal drive, roughing a passer extends a touchdown drive, and then a hold on a quarterback draw keeps you from icing the game. You know, you can't constantly put yourself in a tough situation. You've been fortunate enough to win these games, but you've taken several wins that could have been very comfortable and made them much dicier than than they needed to be. And until they clean that up, this team is not going to reach their ceiling. No, you're right. I mean, they are – it was a game in which even with the yardage difference, that's skewed because of the kick return yardage, hidden yardage that Baylor dominated – it's a game in which they win by two. They're thrilled. But at the same time, I love what Aranda said on Saturday night, and I love what he said Monday, and I love what Jalen Petrie said. They understand they they could have been so much cleaner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just think of the the whole field goal at the end of the first half, Sam. For exa- I mean, that's not quite that's, – that wasn't like a 15-yard penalty led to, the, you know, like the typical mistakes that you're talking about that have now become commonplace. But there also, you know, were missed opportunities, like not recovering that fumble and then Iowa State drives it down, there's three points, and you end up winning by two, you know? Right. You can't make those mistakes. And what's going on just with coverages, you have – just simple crossing routes, they're not picking up the tight end, and a guy goes uncovered. A corner route that he's not exactly handling. And you got Charlie Kohler down basically to your goal line. That's not them. They're good players, but that's on you. That's not them. And you have to clean that up. And if you don't clean that up this week, Oklahoma State has the guys that can take it the distance on you. So instead of giving up three points every other drive, you're giving up 14. So, who would you rather have as a quarterback in this game, Bohannon or Sanders? Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go against the hometown guy, but um, I think most of the coaches in the Big 12 are going to be very happy to have either one of them. Um, Sanders has more experience. But uh, I don't know. Bohannon's looked pretty good, but, you know, it's still early. Um, I'd probably lean Bohannon based on what I've seen. Okay. Anything else, guys? Uh, yeah, I guess, Sam, what are, what are they going to be? I mean, obviously, the, the cleaning up of the mistakes, you know, self-inflicted penalties, things of that nature. But uh, I guess, you know, what are kind of your your two big, these could be the turning points in the game factors, matchups uh, heading into tomorrow? Can Baylor get the running game going against this Oklahoma State defense? They're going to do a lot to challenge you 
with numbers, with movement, with blitzing, with aggressive coverages. If you can get the running game to at least be somewhat reliable to where you can formation your way into some favorable matchups against the coverages, I think that's a huge edge to Baylor. Um, obviously, turnovers and penalties will be the other one. And then defensively, can you prevent them from hitting those big plays to keep their offense alive? Boise, Tulsa, Missouri State, all three of them were able to buckle down on OSU for the, for the most part. you know. And uh, K-State's really the only game where they went off. And is that OSU turning a corner, or does that say more about K-State? It's early in the season. We don't know. That's why they play the games. The evidence keeps coming each weekend. Uh, Sam, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sam Bradshaw, Sikkim365.com, college football, X's and O's analyst. And if you're a uh, Baylor fan in particular, uh, I think you'll enjoy Sam or S11 as he's known on the board, his work uh, each week, you know, breaking things down and explaining them in X's and O's and giving you kind of that insight so he does a good job and if that's your thing and you're a Baylor fan well it's a one of the many reasons to sign up for the premium section which is uh, another way to support and uh, would welcome you aboard if you want to join sickum 365com but that's where you can get a lot of Sam's goodies like right after games or the day after and you know previewing as well along with this segment so appreciate his time as always one quick note then we go to the games predict the games Dr. Livingstone was in Congress we mentioned that yesterday I watched some of the testimony uh, she's kind of pretty calm, cool, and collected. Now, whether they got anything done, I don't know. Was it just a, hey, look at me. We're trying to act like we care. I'm talking about Congress. I don't know. But she uh, she held her own when I was watching it. And very directive, uh, very, um, I guess you could say, um, focused and understood what was there and what they were trying to talk about, NIL, the National Labor Relations Board, and much more. Well, it's that's got to be a really hard thing to do when you have – Questions coming at you. You have no idea what some of these people are going to say and how they're going to try to grandstand. One congressman literally asked, what happens if the Chinese Communist Party <laughs> wanted to give somebody an NIL deal? And the answer to that is they could give anybody a deal to endorse them. They essentially have done it with Disney. I mean, or, or you know, the NBA had a problem. I mean, like, I mean why, why would they... And the other thing, question is like sometimes you like ask a congressman, why don't you say that out loud in the bathroom to yourself before you say it in front of America? So you yeah. say like, well, why why would they do that? So the Chinese Communist Party's plan is to like, you know, who's going to be really good for us recruiting wise? The quarterback at Boise State. Yeah, he'll he'll get people onto communism if like no one else. Come on. Yeah, uh, less politics in sports would be great as far as like the intervening into, you know, these government meetings and all that. I understand they play a role, but man, it's probably my least favorite part of, of what we talk about on a daily basis yeah. is when the government gets involved. All right, Big 12, here we go. Uh, Paul, we'll uh, start with Craig to start these uh, predictions. We go Texas.